how you came about this idea of, um, of doing this documentary. What motivated you and how did you start? Yeah, hi guys, uh, this is Harbaldeep Singh. I'm the editor director of this film. And this is a great question. So I've been following farmers' protests from day one when uh, farmers from Punjab went to Delhi. And before that, it was more a political topic, uh, pros and cons of farmers' bills, economics. But when human rights violations are happening, uh, I thought I need to do something. So I start, I just wrote a white paper. So I just wanted to capture my thoughts, me and one of my friends who's not here, Vindu Singh Garcha, wherever you are, hey, hi. Uh, so we wrote a white paper and we published it online. And I remember 31st December, Rajner and Kaur, uh, director of this documentary, she called me to say Happy New Year. And she said, Harbaugh, the white paper is great but people don't read 15 pages in this age. Uh, so why, as a filmmaker, you should make a documentary and I will narrate it. And I need to tell, I'm sitting with the two ladies here. I was always a big fan. I watched Rajdin's uh, documentary called Jyoti Kasturi. It's on PBS, go watch it. It was a beautiful narrated uh, narration and I thought one day uh, if I get an opportunity, I'll work with her. So that triggered uh, this documentary. We thought we'll make, make a 15, 20 minute uh, YouTube video but when we started exploring this topic, and uh, thanks to United States who provided us uh, farmer protest footage, so when I watched this footage, I had like 10 hours of footage, I watched it, and I had really tears in my eyes because of the, some of the narrative you listened from those farmers. So I thought, this, this is a story I need to tell, and I'm not a documentarian, I'm not trained as a documentarian, so that's why you will see, it's a very different style of a documentary. I use music and you will see there are some relief moments with, with some kind of a smile comes on your face. So I said, let me tell a story and I was very clear from the beginning, I don't want to go into uh, politics of farm bills. I wanted to show a human journey, a farmer's journey. And I wanted to explore what's the spiritual strength, which is keeping them going for 10 months. 600 people have died you need a special kind of a strength to, to survive this kind of a protest. So I think it was a journey, I would say. So her message triggered that thought, and then a team came together, and I always tell, director's job is to bring talented people and just give them that playground. And I think I had all the talented people. Uh, I did nothing. Once in a while, I used to throw my tantrums because that what the director's job is, I believe. So but, uh, the rest of the job is done by these talented uh, people who are sitting here. And some of the folks who are not here, Andhra Pal Singh, uh, writer of this documentary with me. Uh, Vishwajit Singh, who's also known as Captain, Sikh Captain America. He did all illustrations because I wanted to use a chapter format. I wanted to put illustrations and uh, what better person than Vishwajit. And uh, one special person, Dr. Manpreet Singh, who composed music for this film. In my opinion, it's the soul of this film. So every time I watch this film, and I've watched it a million times from editing to, to release, I still get goosebumps and I get fears in my eyes. Yeah, the, the music, I think, uh, you've mentioned this uh, before, that you felt that it was the soul of the film um, because uh, it really drives the emotion, it cues the emotions, right? It, it, you spent a lot of time. Yeah, with music. I, I think music is always a subtext. Uh, again, the cinema is an orchestra. A lot of uh, instruments need to come together, and when all everything tunes together, that makes a great film. And uh, definitely, I wanted to use, uh, and this is called a uh, Gurmat Sangeet. So, this is like a Sikh Shabbat or Sikh hymns, and it's called a Gurmat Sangeet. And all uh, Sikh Shabbats, are composed on rocks. So in, in Indian uh, musical, uh, Hindustani classical music, everything is on rocks. So it evokes a certain kind of emotions when, uh, when uh, that music comes in. I think it supplemented uh, those uh, scenes together. And apart from the music, I just wanted to maybe uh, go a little bit further too. And uh, you watched Monica in this documentary. And Monica was known, uh, she's a well-known actress from Hollywood and uh, Bollywood and dialogue. Uh, she will be in Hollywood soon, so I, I forget today. Uh, just mark my notes. Uh, and I've been with Monica on, on few protest sites. And I saw that passion in her. And, I, and we thought, this documentary has to be told from a diaspora perspective. Why diaspora is so passionate to, to support farmers, which is happening 6,000 miles in India. So Monica, because she's born in America, so she's an American, she is Punjabi, and she's Sikh. 
And I thought this is the best package I could find and uh, her passion and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you will have more questions for her. So I think, uh, yeah, Monica is a, she's a metaphor of uh, diaspora. She represents all of us in this room and she brought very, very emotions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. So we were just talking um, earlier about your passion, um, and um, uh, you're, would you, you consider yourself an activist, right, on this issue now? A brand new one. A brand new one, a brand new one. <laughs> it really comes across, obviously, you know, you could, because a lot of documentaries tend to be understated, you know, they, 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 they don't want to go overboard because they're afraid of uh, sounding too promotional or too, um, you know, they're advocating too hard or something. But, um, you really, you re you really cut through it all, you know, and said the way you feel, and I found that to be really unique and also, but very powerful. Um, you know, you were very natural, and maybe, um, in my opinion, um, because Harbaugh, you you say that you're not experienced documentarian, right? You don't have that experience. You, maybe somebody more experienced might say, can you bring it, reel it in a little bit? Can you do it? But he let you go for it. How, do you feel, how did you feel about that? You recognize what I'm talking about? I do, I do, because um, when you're being directed, right, you're being directed on how to speak, what lines to say exactly, what to emote, what not to emote. And I think um, the beauty of her bull uncles and mine relationship is that we have a history, history that's not just confined to the borders of cinema, right? We know each other, we're from the same community. We've known each other for years. So what that allowed to happen was a certain play, like a little dance about, where we could um, play on each other's strengths and cover up our weaknesses. One of my strengths is that I'm able to express myself very, very well. And with on this topic, it's a very personal topic for me. As I uh, mentioned briefly in the other theater, I am a daughter and granddaughter of farmers. However, I did not get involved into a farmer's protest until my grandma had a little bit of a tantrum when um, the farmers were moving from Punjab to Haryana and what they were going through there. And seeing her pain, I was angry. Um, a lot of diaspora children, my generation especially, are raised by their grandparents. The bond we have with them is very different from the bond that we have with our parents. I'm not valuing, valuing one over the other but there's something special there. I always say we have a lot to learn from our grandparents, especially those within the Punjabi community. They have experienced 47, the partition, which hit Northern India a lot more harshly than the rest of it, and then 84. Our grandparents saw that. Not only that, they saw multiple pandemics as well. The strength that we see in them is beautiful. It's dignified. It's a silent strength. You know, it comes from very deep-rooted understanding about how the world works. The way they function, the way they understand things, and the, the, the quiet kind of ability to keep going no matter what happens. We don't have that at our age. Someone like me, something goes wrong, I wanna cry, I wanna do this, like, we can't handle the bumps in the roads as well as they can. And that is something I've learned through the farmers' protest, and it has left me in awe. And my grandmother isn't there, but there's something in her that, like, whenever she sees a picture, whenever she sees something, like her inside speak. And it was my love for her that pushed me to become an activist. Because our grandparents have traumas that have never healed. For me, like I mentioned in the documentary, it was very important for me to show her that times have changed. We are not the same people we were in 47 or 84. We now have a voice. We have avenues to make our voice heard. We have ways to raise issues. Are we a minority community? Yes. But are we helpless? No. We all have the right to raise our voices, and we should. I always say that every third second we should be talking about the farmers' protest. Why? Because it's a domino effect. If you speak to one person, that one person will speak to another person, and that person will speak to another person, and that is how you raise awareness. 
So thank you for your question. I went on a little rant, but long story short, keep talking about it. Rosarind, you're the, the beautiful voice throughout the throughout the documentary. <laughs> but you know, it adds a nice uh, uh, comparison and contrast. Can you talk about the style of your voiceover? You you feel equally passionate about this subject, I know, and um, you also have a history. Um, can you sort of describe that and uh, talk about your presentation as a, a narrator? Sure. Um, excellent question. Thank you. I think someone asked me this question last night, and they said, as a narrator, one would keep their emotions aside and not let it come through. And I think my answer and reply back was, no way. There's no way that I could not let my passion and my emotion come through in this film. It's so moving. Every time I see it, I tear up because we're not there but there's so much that we can do for the farmers and be their voice through whatever strengths that you guys have, whatever contacts, whatever network that you are able to do, exactly what Monica said, please, please spread the word. It's been over a year and they're still there. They're not leaving. So to not have the emotion, to not be able to share that and spread it to the entire world, I will say we have been incredible in this journey. We've been, we did it over COVID, okay? We were virtual. We did this, we had people in Massachusetts, we had people in New York, New Jersey, and uh, Toronto, I mean, it was crazy. We did it, we put all of it together to see it come alive on this screen. How VG put this magic behind the scenes to make it come together. It was such an amazing experience, and now we have this platform. We have been selected in over 20 international film festivals. <laughs> but I hate to say it, our community has no understanding of what that means. 20 international film festivals with winning over eight awards. We have won Best Featured Documentary. VG has won Best Editing. First Documentary. First Full Length Feature. First Full Length Feature. And he's won Best Editing. The Best Editing Award. Over hundreds. I mean, this is like crazy stuff, right? We've won um, Best Nominee for the music. Dr. Manpreet Singh is amazing. He's Dr. Gurnam Singh's nephew, if you're not aware of who he is. And what a humble soul. He did this with no question. He just said, absolutely, Benji, we're there for you. I will do whatever I need to do. So the team that we've collected has done amazing work, and we need help in getting this across. I think that's the passion that we want to bring out. I mean, the, the history of narration, yes, I've, I've done documentaries before. I've done CDs before. I've done a lot of animated movies. But I think this is more than that. This is so much more than that. And we have to make it known. Questions here for any of the any of the people up here? Anyone have? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so once we were done with uh, this film, and uh, I have a training in filmmaking, but my full-time job is different. So this is, and actually, I I need to acknowledge that. So. We're not full-time filmmakers. Everybody has a full-time job. Fenty works at Wall Street. She works for UN. I have a job in a healthcare. Angad is part of uh, Novartis Group. Dr. Manpreet Singh has his IT job. Vishwajit has his own job. Everybody was doing a moonlighting, working at night, on the weekends to make this film. So very early, we decided, hey, this is an independent film. We don't have millions of dollars to, uh, to market it. So our strategy was, let's try to send it to all international film festivals. So we decided not to send it to Cannes, Toronto, uh, and uh, Sundance, because it's exclusive. So once you're selected at a big film festivals, you can't take your film to other film festivals. So we picked IMDb top-rated 40 film festivals. 
So we say, hey, let's, let's see if people or if audiences connect you with our film. And as Benji said, we got selected at 20 international film festivals across US, Canada, uh, Japan, Berlin, and some of the countries like Slovakia and Lithuania, uh, Italy. So I think it's a, it's a global movement when people watch it. I think farming is, again, as we said, the civilization started from farming. Everybody's connecting to, to the farmer's voice. So our first strategy works. So let's go to international film festival across the world. It will, it will give us confidence here. Yeah, our, our film has, has strength. And our next strategy was to really, uh, and again, Chicago uh, South Asian Film Festival. Thank you to KFTG and Jigger. I need to mention their names because they have been a big, big supporter of this film. And when uh, we talked to them about the world premiere, we were, we were super excited. Hey. This is the first time audience will watch this film on a big screen. In a real auditorium, when the, uh, the, the, the lights are down and you are connecting to, as, as somebody said, the films are the escapist medium, but I wanted you to transform to, to the protest side. So this is working. So next step is to, uh, uh, to really take it to the streaming platform. So if you know anybody at any streaming platform, anybody, yeah, please uh, help us with that. Uh, it's a nonprofit uh, film. But uh, yeah, our real aim is to take it to the streaming platform so everybody can watch it. Have the farmers had the opportunity to see this or will they get the opportunity? So um, because, like I said, my family's from a farming background, we're affiliated with BKU. Um, they know about it. Um, they are excited to watch it, but because we're trying to hold it off for um, more distribution, either on a streaming platform or however we decide to go about this, um, we have not sent any versions of this film out to anyone um, besides uh, uh, Film Fest. And I, I just wanted to add to that question too. I think the film, as a filmmaker myself, I wanted to tell this story because I'm passionate. Everybody who become part of this film are passionate about this thing. But sometimes it can be tainted as, oh, this is a political film. And, and I know I, we got rejections from film festivals too because they thought it's a political and we don't want to entertain that. And I tell the people, yeah, this has a political undertone, but you need to talk about the human journey, the farmer journey. So this film is about the journey. We may have a different ideology about if these farm bills are against or for farmers, but I think we just need to see that human plight, uh, the farmer's plight, uh, what's happening at the protest site. So that was the journey we wanted to do. So uh, as Monica said, right now it's in the film, uh, film uh, festival circuits. Uh, we, we haven't sent it to them, but I'm sure it, this, this festival will open doors for so many other discussions. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, great question, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question. So the thing is, we live in America, okay? And there's a lot of narrative going on, what's happening with the farm bills in India is, uh, capitalism works, and this is uh, the free market works, totally free market work, capitalism, uh, capitalism work, we live in America. So as a filmmaker, I wanted to explore uh, this topic. Yes, we live in America, we, we believe in capitalism, I believe in capitalism. It, it, uh, and again, that's a different discussion. But I believe there are a few industries which are not meant for free markets, and agriculture being one, because agriculture is very different from manufacturing. In a manufacturing, you have assembly line, you have a perfect quality control, so every product which comes out is the same. But that's not true with agriculture. Agriculture is dependent on Mother Nature, uh, the weather uh, parameters, uh, the rain, hurricane, it can change your outcome, uh, the yield which you're gonna get from the farm. So should we put agriculture under the same parameters as any other industry like telecom manufacturing? My answer to that is no. So then we research what happened in America because we know if you uh, look up uh, uh, the, the change of uh, the jobs or how uh, the different sectors were changing in the country, obviously we were pretty big in agriculture, and then the manufacturing came, the Ford came, and so people had an opportunity to move from farming to manufacturing. So that's the first parallel we draw, and we 
Why do you say this thing? Can we learn from history? If we had made mistake before, do you want to repeat the mistake or not? That was the first reason. And the second reason was, yes, a lot of farmers, uh, we show 20% less farmers in the US, but those farmers had an opportunity to move to manufacturing, to move to cities and started working and look at Michigan and Detroit. Uh, but in India, if farming goes away, will these farmers get another job? Is, is, there, an, is there enough employment in India? So that's another, that's a, that's a subtext to that. I think that's an open question for all of us to ask. If agriculture is discouraged by these farm bells, where will these people go? And there are a lot of examples. I, we have shown this in a documentary. There's a reverse migration happening within India. So when COVID hit India, there were like two crore people moved from cities to villages. Now think about extrapolated if these farm, farmers move to manufacturing, if let's assume there are jobs, how will it impact the whole uh, the urban planning in India? So there are multiple questions which you need to ask. So, um, you know, I think in terms of awareness, um, what else, what other actions can be taken? Like in the U.S., you can write to your senator and influence uh, the government. In, in, in India, what, is, what are some of the things that can be done to? So, um, so to, without getting too political, in India, the issue, the major issue is that there isn't um, a free media. So no matter what happens, no information is going to get out. Because I used to live in India. And I had no idea. So there was a farmer's protest that happened previously while I was in India. And I did not know of that. I learned of that after this protest has started. So living in India, I think we're pretty, um, not sheltered, we're, we're, yeah, sheltered, we're sheltered. And, but I think living outside of the US, that's where we can really raise our voices because we have much more avenues and, um, you have a f the freedom to raise your voice. Um, the, the, a lot of people always complain, why are other celebrities or you know, some of my contemporaries not speaking as much as they would like them to? And I always say that the difference between me and them is that I live in the United States. I don't have to worry about going back to India and working because I'm very well taken care of by both my fiance and my father. Other people have to worry about their work, about their livelihoods, about their families, about whether or not, you know, they're gonna survive to see tomorrow. The biggest example is like Topsy Pandu and Diljit. They were being vocal and they got income rates, or I don't know what other rates they got. But, so it's very important that if you're safe and sound in the diaspora, that you get loud, and you get really loud. People ask me how, on your social media. One of your social medias, post one today. Every day, write a letter to your congressman and senator, senator. Just copy and paste the same letter. Once a day before bed, just send it. They, they have to, the way it works in government offices is that they tally the amount of letters they get. And if they get between 10 to 20, they will call you back. That's how we worked with McGovern. We, every day, we had a team of five people calling his office, leaving voice messages, writing at least five letters a day. And I got a meeting, well we both got a meeting, and we got him to make a statement. And we got him to agree that if a farmer's resolution is put, passed in Congress or comes up in Congress, he will vote in favor. So a lot of people don't wanna put in the work because it's an uphill battle. But if we don't, who will? So when you guys go home, come up with a game plan. In your district, find five other people that agree with you and that agree with what you're saying and start the letter writing. Sometimes, a lot of times what happens is that we look at the tough battle or the, you know, the tough hill we have to, uh, to climb and, sometimes, and we get disheartened. Those are the times that we have to remind ourselves that sometimes there's a greater force at play that if we just take that first initial step, somehow the one above or the universe or whatever you believe in, that source of power aligns things for you. But we have to take the first step. And if we genuinely feel that we can do something, the one above will help us. So I, I ask all of you today, if you do one thing, 
or you make one change to your daily routine, make it that letter to your congressman and senator. Copy and paste the same thing every day. That's literally all you have to do. That's literally what we did. The same exact voicemail, we, all of us, we left the same voicemails every day, five times a day. That's, it, it, yes, it was redundant and difficult, but that was all it took. It took us, what, about two weeks, three weeks? And, we, and I got a response and we set up the meeting. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I, just, I just want to congratulate you for your work. It was a really nice movie. Thank you very much. Um, how can we show this movie to other people? Is it online? Is it like... No, no, I, it's not... I mean, uh, the purpose of this movie is to show the people who don't know. All of us, we know what's happening, right? Definitely. And, and we can talk offline how if you want to do a special screening for some of the folks, we can do that. But again, uh, we would like it to be on a streaming platform so where people can go to Netflix or Amazon and they can watch it. But in between, if you want to do a stream, let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have another question? Uh, well, you wanted to wrap it up. Yeah, we have to wrap it up. If you have any questions, uh, we're going to go outside now. It's time to wrap it up, unfortunately. But um, uh, we can, uh, we'll be out in the lobby, and you guys can uh, talk. We can all talk then. Yeah, no, he said we got to wrap it up, unfortunately. But thank you very much for coming. Unfortunately, the room, we got to leave. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our whole time is so much. I really appreciate it.